If you have your Bibles today, and you would join me in the 13th chapter of the book of Romans, Paul's epistle, his letter to the Christian church in the city of Rome. We're going to begin today at the 8th verse. And we'll read through the end of the chapter, which is verse 14. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. And the King James text today reads, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time, to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. If you bow your heads with me a moment, King Jesus, Lord, once again, God, we come boldly before the throne of grace as the Word of God declares. It's our privilege as children of the Most High. Master, the Word of God is our greatest possession. It is by far the most valuable asset the Church of the Living God possesses today. The truth of God is found within the pages, but it, like gold that is buried in a mountain, can only be gleaned and can only be mined when we approach it with sincerity and when we allow the Holy Ghost from heaven to assist us, Lord in finding that precious vein and following that vein, keeping the Word of God in context. Master, today, not using it and turning it about in order to serve our own purposes and to create our own doctrines, but as the Word of God declares, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Master, help me as the preacher of the gospel today to deliver this word to the people of God that it might bring benefit to them, that it might bring forth fruit in their lives and mine as well to righteousness and godliness and true holiness. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name, Amen. Praise God and amen. 
some people who would listen to this preacher preach will take various things that I say and various things that I have said over the years out of context and they will harp on it and they will try to suggest that the message that comes out of this pulpit in this church is something different than it is. I've said in recent weeks as I was preaching, for instance, that God is not as hung up on the sex lives and the private lives of individuals as the church is. And I'm going to tell you today that I stand by that comment, I stand by that statement. I know that it is a fact. You go through the Old Testament, you constantly, 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 constantly see people behaving sexually, intimately, in a manner that is so contrary to godliness, and yet you never ever see God unleashing His judgment upon people for those actions. You see the Lord unleashing His judgment only when actions contradict His commandments relative to idolatry relative to false gods and false teaching. That is God's greatest concern today as it was in biblical times. When the apostles gathered together in Jerusalem to address the question, what matters of the law should we address when it comes to the Gentile believer, because there were Jews who were trying to suggest that Gentile believers in Christ still needed to be circumcised according to the law of Moses. And there were many who came along and said, no, the law in its entirety still must be followed, still must be embraced. And so there was a lot of contradiction in the early Christian church. You know, it cracks me up. Cults and cult leaders always try to say that one of the evidences that the church today is not what the church ought to be and that it's not the true church is there's too many variations in teaching. There are too many variations in denominations. Too many people believe too many different things. And they're all reading the same Bible. And, and that's not how it was in the early church. Honey, you so far out of your mind. You, you don't even know what you're talking about. It's true. I got news for you. Denominations go back to the earliest days of Christianity. You say, no, they don't. Oh, yes, they do. Paul said, some say I'm of Paul, and others say I'm of Apollos. Oh, they had their favorites. They claimed to follow their teacher. They claimed to follow their leader, just like the Methodists claimed to follow Wesley, and the Baptists claimed to follow Calvin. And you know, I mean, it, it's no different today than it ever was. and It's not at all different. Paul said, until we all come, until we all come, into the unity of the faith. There will be no singular knowledge of truth. There will be no singular knowledge of all that God has for us until Jesus comes. Until then, as long as we're in human bodies, there's going to be variations. There's going to be differences. There are going to be doctrines. There are going to be uh, debates and discussions going on. That is all part and parcel of the human contribution to the Christian church. When they came together to address the matter of what in the law should the Gentile believers, if anything, be concerned with? Because we know that Christ is the end of the law for believers. But is there anything at all within the law that Christians, New Testament believers, 
ought to be concerned with. Well, the apostles at Jerusalem came up with a final draft of what they believed to be uh, issues that were addressed within the law that needed to be uh, carried over, as it were, into the New Testament. And they said, yes, just these few things. New Testament believers ought to abstain from things strangled. They ought to abstain from the consumption of blood. They're to abstain from idolatry. They're to abstain from fornication. That's it. Out of 500 plus laws in the Law of Moses, the New Testament apostles came up with less than a half dozen items. When you look at the items and you investigate them, we have a bunch of Western minds that read the Bible as though it were written by Westerners, and it was not. We have a bunch of people in the West who believe that the Bible... Uh, is perfectly in, er, and without even the slightest error translated, and I'm sorry, but it is not. Right. You talk to any Jewish rabbi, and that Jewish rabbi will tell you that the uh, English translation, any translation, for that matter, of Hebrew, is like breastfeeding a baby through some sort of fabric. You cannot get a pure, clean understanding of it uh, as it is translated because Hebrew does not translate flawlessly into any language. Hebrew is a highly specific, I mean, that language, it's a very complex language. God chose Hebrew for the Jewish people for a reason. Because of all the languages in the world, Hebrew is one of the most complex, one of the most specific. You cannot debate, when you understand Hebrew, you cannot debate whatsoever what it says. I've studied a number of uh, Jewish rabbis and writers, and it's funny because they've said when it comes to the what we call the Old Testament canon, they said, you cannot debate what it says. The words say exactly what they say. He said, Hebrew is such that there's no debate as to what it says. But there is debate as to how it is applied, how you apply what is said. And that is where the Hebrew uh, uh, masters and the Hebrew um, rabbis would have conflict, not in what is said, but rather in how you apply what is said. If you look at what the apostles said to the early church, every single one of the items they addressed that they said ought to be carried into the New Testament era for New Testament believers, every single one of those items is directly connected to idolatry. Every one of them. There are people who read the words. They don't bother with the etymology. They don't bother looking back into the original language or anything to understand what's really being said. No, they're able to use it based on what they think it says in English, and therefore they just run with that, and they could care less what God is really saying so long as it gives them something they can use to knock somebody over the head. But even when it talks about uh, abstaining from fornication, it speaks of sexual conduct that is related to idolatry and idolatrous practice. This is something that we in the modern world are not really familiar with a whole lot because we really don't see it practiced in most modern religions. We don't see 
the same level of sexual activity married to religious activity or religious ritual for that matter as we do when we look back at religious practices in ancient times going back to Babylon and from Babylon forward most of the ancient world religions were very sexual many of their rituals many of their practices within their temples actually involved sexual conduct between a parishioner, as it were, and the priest. Oftentimes there were far too many parishioners and the priests could not possibly physically keep up with all these parishioners. So oftentimes the temples would hire people to act out these sexual practices these sexual rituals with members on behalf of the priesthood and these people are what are known today as temple prostitutes when you read in certain translations of the bible the word temple prostitute that is what they're referring to temple prostitutes is what was being referred to when the King James translation chose the word sodomite. When you read the word sodomite in the King James translation, it is in fact, if you'll do a little research, if you'll look into it, you'll find that they were in fact referring to temple prostitutes. They were talking about people who engaged in sexual practices on behalf of a false god, on behalf of an idol, in some ritual fashion. Well, we don't see that a whole lot today. We love to read the Bible. We love, preachers love to get up and preach from the Bible. As though it is a collection of thoughts that God just dropped out of heaven at random. Well, you know, Paul wrote this in this chapter and it just fell out of heaven. Uh, he just wrote about this particular subject and then he moved on to another subject. And a lot of times, Tommy, they act like subject A and subject B in the same chapter didn't even have anything to do with one another. They pull stuff out of context. They ignore the context of the times. They ignore what was going on. They ignore why Paul wrote this letter to begin with. Our primary text today comes from Romans chapter 13. Paul was writing a letter to the church of Jesus Christ, which existed at the time in the city of Rome. Rome was thought to be, if not known to be, in the ancient world, one of the most ungodly, heathenistic, wicked, evil cities. It had a reputation around the world for being a place where every kind of immoral, ungodly, heathenistic conduct could be found. I just said a little while ago about New York City, you know. It's so big and so diverse and you, anything you want to do, you can find if you want to be a straight man and woman who engage in wife swapping, you can find clubs in New York City where husbands and wives can go together and swap out their mates. Heterosexual, mind you. We're not talking gay. We're talking heterosexual. You can find sex clubs in New York City for heterosexual people where you go in, you take off your clothes, and you then can engage in any kind of thing you want to engage in with any woman or any man that's in that club and everybody just there for having a party, having a free-for-all. But of course, to hear the heterosexual preach it, to hear the heterosexual pre uh, preacher tell it, uh, you know, homosexuality is immoral 
immoral and ungodly and they engage in all these hideous and horrible practices. And if you're heterosexual, you're ahead of the game just by reason of your sexual orientation below me. Below me. There are so many evils committed in the name of sexuality, whether it be straight or gay. There are so many immoral acts that are engaged in, whether it be straight or gay. It, the orientation itself is by far not evil. There are things that people do within that orientation. There are straight people who rape. There are straight people who molest. There are straight people uh, who engage in uh, sexual activity, manipulation of minors. There are gay people who do these same things. But to say that one or the other engages in these sort of things and the other doesn't, honey, you are foolish and ignorant beyond words. You are completely out of your mind if you think that is the case. Paul was writing to the church at Rome, and it is imperative when you read the book of Romans that you bear in mind that Paul knows the letter he's writing. He is writing to the belly of the beast, so to speak. He knows he's writing this letter to a group of believers who are living in a pit of immorality and indecency. You also have to understand that the Jewish people for centuries, no millennium, were convinced that non-Jewish people, Gentiles, were in general very ungodly, very heathenistic, very immoral. See, they saw themselves as possessing the law of God as given by Moses, and they alone had God's law. They alone had what defined right from wrong. Therefore, everybody outside of Israel in their, in their mind were lawless. They had no law. They had nothing to guide them. You see, we have the law. God Himself through Moses gave us the law. And that's why they hold the law in such high esteem because it was God's gift to us, the Jewish people. Only we possessed a knowledge of right and wrong. Only we possessed a knowledge of good and evil. Only we possessed a knowledge of holy and unholy. Therefore, only we could possibly do the right thing. Only we could possibly live a godly life, a holy life, because we're the only ones that had any knowledge of what defined godliness and holiness. Do you follow what I'm saying? Well, I got news for you. The Jewish apostles who were at the heart of the Christian faith, especially in writing their epistles to Gentile churches, which the majority of the churches they wrote to were, some of the churches, like the church at Rome, was in the heart of a Gentile community, because obviously the Italians, the Romans, were not Jewish. But the church itself in Rome consisted of both Jew and Gentile. So you have to understand, when you read the epistles, there is a reason why the apostles almost seem obsessed at times with morality. They almost seem obsessed at times with behavior and conduct. And they're constantly reminding the church, you can't act that way and make heaven. You can't act that way and see the kingdom of God. You know, but there was a reason why they approached things this way. It is because for eons, their community, their nation viewed everyone outside of Judaism as being filthy dogs. The Jewish community literally used to look at Gentiles and they would call them dogs. Jesus, in trying to push away one Gentile woman, you might remember, he actually deferred to that practice. When he said to her, it is not good to take the children's bread and to cast it before the dogs, you remember? 
He wasn't doing, he wasn't saying anything she hadn't heard before. No, that was a common reference. That was a common way for Jewish people to look at and to view and to address non-Jewish people at that time. But the Lord was testing her. He said that to test her. Let me see if she'll keep coming. Let me see if she'll press through anyway. And she did. <laughs> and then the Lord rewarded her and said, Oh my, said I hadn't seen faith like this anywhere. This lady's exercise. This is what I'm talking about. You want something from God? Follow this lady's example. It didn't matter if I remained quiet. It didn't matter if I answered her nasty. It didn't, it didn't matter if I told her no. She said, still kept coming. She still kept pressing through. Her faith still would not fail. There's an example of someone you need to follow. So even though the Lord used that language, I don't want anybody to think that he thought of her in that light. No. He was testing her. He was putting her through her test. When you read the epistles, you have to bear in mind the apostles are writing to people that they know are generally coming from a background, even if they came from a religious background of one nature or another, it was not a background that believed in any kind of limits as to your conduct or your behavior. There were, there were no right and wrong. There, was no, uh, there were no guidelines as to morality and immoral and how you should conduct yourself and how you should deal with other people. That's not the nature of the ancient religions that most of these people were coming from. Therefore, the epistles are written uh, in, a, in a very different light. And when you understand the environment in which they're written, then you understand better why things are worded the way they're worded by the apostles. In this particular portion of Scripture, Romans chapter 13, Paul's writing to the church at Rome, which is comprised of both Jewish and Gentile believers. And he begins by saying, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. There was so much conversation. There were Jewish believers within the Roman church. Therefore, you had better know there was conversation about the law within the church. You had better know there was controversy about the law within the church. So here Paul is addressing the church knowing that he's got Christians who know nothing of the law. And then he has Christians on the other side who still want to believe that even as a follower of Christ, I must still embrace and live the law of Moses. I'll tell you, if you think Scripture isn't inspired, if you think God didn't inspire Paul or the other apostles in writing their epistles, let me tell you something, um, you, you're wrong. Because the way that he addresses this issue right here, he actually is very clearly defining things for the non-Jews who believe, and at the same time he is making a very clear statement to the Jews who believe. He's literally making one statement, but he's saying something very clear to both sides of the equation. Look at what he says. I'm talking today about I owe you. You ever had somebody do something for you that was so kind and so unexpected and you were so appreciative for what they had done that you just felt like, you know, I'm obligated to this person. That, that was so sweet and so kind and so unexpected that I, now I feel obligated to them. And a lot of times we'll say to someone who has done something for us, you know, of this nature, we'll say, I owe you. Boy, I owe you. 
I feel a sense of obligation to you for this. You know, you didn't have to do this. There was nothing in the world that made this a requirement for you. You, you were under no contract. You were under no obligation. Yet you did this for me. That puts me in a position where I feel obligated to you now. To, to one day return the favor. You know what I'm talking about? You ever had somebody who's done something so kind for you or so nice for you, and then as time goes by at some point, they come into a situation where they need something and you can do something for them and you'll say, well, you know, I feel like I owe them because... Sometime back they did this for me or said or they once did this for me and you know I owe them I, I you know does that person feel like you owe them no does that person did they place you under any obligation when they did this for you no when you said I owe you they said to you no you don't you don't owe me anything I just wanted to do this for you right but then later we turn around and say, oh, but I feel obligated. I, I feel like I owe them. They fed me when I was hungry. They came to my assistance when nobody else would help me. They did for me what I couldn't get anybody to, to do for me. They gave me help when nobody else would give me help. And I feel like I owe them. I feel obligated to them. In the 13th chapter of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul writes to both the Jewish and the Gentile Christians at Rome owe no man anything, meaning feel no obligation to anyone. He said, you don't owe anybody anything. You don't have an obligation to any other human being on this planet but to love one another. The only obligation you have to one another is to love one another. That's the only obligation you have. You are not obligated to sit in judgment of them. You are not obligated to criticize them. You are not obligated to straighten them out when they're wrong. You are not obligated to preach at them when you think they ought to do things different. No. The only obligation you have to anyone else on this planet is to love them. Yes. How many believers feel an obligation to love their neighbor? How many Christians feel an obligation to love their fellow believer? How many Christians, you know, go to church and I don't go to church because they're, they're just full of hypocrites. Well, I got news for you, honey. You're failing in your obligation. Well, what obligation is that? The only obligation, Paul said, you have to one another is to love them. That means you've got to find a way to look past their faults. That means you have to find a way to look past their weaknesses. That means you've got to find a way to look beyond the sin in their life and the things you disagree with. You know why? Because God did that for you. Yes. Paul said the only obligation you have to any man is to love one another. But listen, he said, For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Aha, now he mentions that key word that makes the ear of the Jewish believer perk up. What's that Paul said? Read it again. What did Paul say about the law? And the reader says, For he that loveth one and loveth another hath fulfilled the law. But Paul continues, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. What has Paul just done? He has just quoted the commandments from the Ten Commandments that address man's conduct toward man. Remember, 
The, the Ten Commandments are divided into two categories. First of all, it is God's conduct toward, or man's conduct toward God. And the second portion is man's conduct toward man. So now he quotes the commandments relative to man's conduct toward man. He said, for this, and he quotes the commandments, for these, he is saying, and if there be any other commandments, if there's anything else out there, it is briefly comprehended in this saying. In other words, it is summed up in this way. Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So Paul says, we can stand here and argue and debate about the law all day and all night. He said, but the truth of the matter is, when it comes to man's conduct toward other men, human beings' conduct amongst themselves, between themselves, he said, it is all summed up in one simple phrase. Love your neighbor as yourself. I wouldn't want... my neighbor cheating on me on cheating with my wife on me therefore I'm not going to cheat with my neighbor's wife on him hello now mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to do that to somebody I wouldn't want that done to me if I wouldn't want it done to me I'm not going to do it to somebody else do you hear what I'm telling you now I wouldn't want somebody else craving what I've got so badly that they'll do just about anything they can to get their hands on it and coveting my property. I wouldn't want other people looking at me that way and feeling that way about my stuff, whether it be my wife, my kids, my property, whatever the case might be. Therefore, I'm not going to do that to them either. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you wouldn't want your neighbor running off with your wife, then what in the name of God makes you think you're justified in running off with somebody else's wife. Yep. Said it, the law is summed up simply. He said it's summed up very neatly and tidily in this simple saying, love your neighbor as yourself. He goes on to say, listen, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is where we have Christians in the world today who are so foolish and so idiotic and so moronic. They want to turn homosexuality into some great evil, some horrible thing. Now you talk to a Jewish rabbi and the Jewish rabbi is going to look at you. There's one rabbi I read, he's very famous and very, uh, very, very well followed in the Jewish community. I think, I can't remember if he's Reform or Orthodox or what he is, but this particular rabbi uh, uh, wrote uh, something that I read and he said, I know Pat Robertson. I know him personally. He said, I've sat down and had meals with him. He said, I asked him one day, why in the world are you fundamentalist Christians so hung up on homosexuality? He said, I do not for the life of me. We don't understand it. We Jews look at you people and wonder what in God's green earth is wrong with you that this one subject is so huge that you're so hung up on it. And he said, Pat Robertson gave him the classic fundamental, Oh, well, that's the biggest issue in the world today. Well, that's the biggest sin. And this rabbi said, not to us it didn't. said, we understand it even within the context of the law. We understand it to be perfectly natural. We don't look at it as being anything strange or unnatural. Uh, and we don't think of it in those terms, not even close. He said, but you know what we do? We look at it like this. If the law forbade certain conduct between two men, because got news for you, the, the law most doesn't say a word one about women, not one word. But then again, you have these people who claim that they're Bible purists and oh we believe the Bible we believe every word of the Bible but boy they sure will add to or take away from it whenever it becomes convenient mm -hmm. 
Well, even though women aren't mentioned, it's implied. Baloney. Bull. If God had something to say about women, he'd have said it. But the rabbi said, even if this one law addressed a certain sexual act between two men, which is all one law in the entire law Moses even alludes to. He said, it's not because it's unholy, it's not because it's ungodly, it's not because it's unnatural. He said, it is because it is God's prerogative. Think about that for a minute. Remember when you're a kid and your mother said, I told you to do this and so, and you looked at her and said, why? And she looked back at you and said, because I said so. There was no other explanation needed. She's mom. If she says she wants it done, then it is to be done. Well, I got news for you. This Jewish rabbi said, it's God's prerogative. Therefore, if God says, I don't want you chewing gum, that doesn't make chewing gum sinful. That doesn't make chewing gum evil. That doesn't make chewing gum ungodly or unnatural. No. He said, it makes it a matter of the law. If you chew gum, you've broken the law. He said, it's that simple. He said, the fact of the matter is, we understand that at the time of the giving of the law, the nation of Israel was just about to march into the promised land. We were just about to become established as a nation with our own land and our own boundaries. And God wanted the nation of Israel to multiply in numbers as fast, as quickly as was humanly possible. Therefore, he made laws that said anything that didn't result in a baby being born, you're not to do. So if you're, pardon my turn of phrase here, if you're horn doggled up and, and you feel the need to do something, he said, according to the law, most you're better off going and finding a hooker, going and finding a prostitute or a whore. And doing your deed with her and filling her belly with your seat, then you are just doing it off by yourself somewhere and letting stuff fall upon the ground. That's what the law said. Didn't have anything to do with it. If you do this, it's so evil, it's so evil. Oh my God, if you do something by yourself, well, you're just the most sinful, evil, ungodly, idiot. No, no, no. That's not at all, not at all the case. Now, some people want to suggest, oh, Pastor Charles, he's out there always trying to give people reason to go out and do ungodly things and to act in ways that are contrary to godliness. Um, you must not listen to very much of my preaching. You're just listening to a phrase here and there, and you're trying to twist it and turn it so it'll accommodate what you want to think about us. But that is not even close to what this pastor preaches. No, Christians live a Christian life. Christians live a godly life. Christians live a holy life. Not to make heaven, but to be a witness and a testimony to the lost. Because our obligation toward one another is nothing short of loving one another. That's our obligation toward one another. Our obligation toward God is to be a witness and a testimony to stand out in a dark world as His child and to be a light that will draw others into fellowship and communion with Himself. That is what God desires of us as believers. That is what God expects of us as his children and that is why we don't drink and smoke and cuss and carry on and carouse and club and drug and do the things that are done in the world it's not a matter of being sent to hell because we've done this or not it's a matter of we're not doing what God would desire we do. And that is that we stand out as a light. If the light behaves as the darkness behaves, then it obviously is not doing its job. 
So in order for us to stand out in the dark world, we have got to be very much the opposite of the world. We can't be motivated by the same things that motivate the world. Every time I get the least bit horned up, bless God, I go out to a bar to find me somebody to lay down with. As a child of God, I don't follow that logic. I don't follow that thinking. As a child of God, I do not pursue things that way. I don't do things that way. Am I telling the truth? Oh, I've had a hard day. Things are going rough for me. Oh, I just need a stiff one to help me make a through. As a child of God, I don't think like that. As a child of God, I don't view things that way. I've got Jesus to lean on. Jesus said, cast all your care upon me. For uh, uh, Excuse me, the writer said, cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. I've got someone I can go to to cast my cares upon. I don't need alcohol as a crutch. I don't need drugs as a crutch. The Word of God teaches that I ought to be in control at all times, that I not give myself over and lose control. This is what the word meekness literally translates, self-control. Therefore, I do not use substances in my body that cause me to no longer be in control of my thoughts or my actions. I don't know about you, but I've been in situations in my life where I had somebody cheat on me and then come to me in tears and tell me, oh, I was drunk. I'm sorry, I was drunk. Um, that's all well and good, but you know what, honey? You won't never one time hear me coming to you with that idiotic excuse because I don't drink. I don't drink. Why do I not drink? Because God's going to send me to hell if I have a drink? No, I don't drink because to do so, uh, I can open myself up to ultimately being in a place where I'm no longer in control. And Christians never put themselves in that position. I don't drink. I don't do drugs because I maintain control. I keep my body under subjection. Isn't that what the Bible teaches us? I can't keep my body under subjection if my mind is under the influence of some substance that's going to turn around and have me waking up in the morning next to something that if I were sober and sound-minded, I wouldn't even talk to, never mind lay down in a bed with. Hello now. I don't lay around with everything that comes down the pike. Well, first of all, I'm married. Secondly, even if I weren't, I don't do that because there are people out there who are seeking love and they're seeking relationships and they're seeking uh, to have something of substance. And then there are those out there who will use those people in order to satisfy their momentary need and then turn around and walk away and never so much as look back. And that person is left hurting, that person is left hollow, that person is left feeling poorly about themselves because once again they've been used by somebody to satisfy their, their sexual urges. And that's not all that person was interested in. Do you follow what I'm telling you? How can I love my neighbor as myself? I wouldn't want somebody doing that to me. If I, now you may be a, a, a little slut puppy running around and all you ever want is sex. That's all well and good, but honey, you're not using people who all they want is sex and you couldn't well know it. Half the time, you're purposely uh, trying to seduce people who uh, you see as weak and you see as vulnerable because all you want to do is satisfy your momentary urge. I got news for you. That's wrong, that is sinful, that is ungodly, that is not keeping with Christian conduct, that is not the way a child of God ought to live. Now put that in your pipe, sister holiness, and smoke it. So by no means do I run around preaching that because you're a believer, nothing's wrong, everything's good, you can do anything you want to do. No, that's not at all what we preach in this church, and anybody who's followed this church for any amount of time knows that to be the case. 
I owe you. I feel an obligation to my neighbor. I feel an obligation to my fellow believer. I feel an obligation to my pastor to love them. That is all God has told me. The Lord said that if I can love those around me as I love myself, if I can learn to love people, that I will have fulfilled the law. So that puts to rest anything that the Jewish side of the congregation at Rome has to say concerning the law, doesn't it? Paul just settled that argument, didn't he? Just said, now the, the law is all summed up very tidily in this simple phrase, love your neighbors yourself. If you can do that, God, news for you, honey, gay and lesbian people can love one another. They can engage in healthy relationships one with another. They can love and support and raise children. They can have families. They can do all of these things. And there is no victim. Hello? There is no victim. You'll notice that when Paul referred to the laws found in the Ten Commandments, nowhere in there is there a commandment relative to homosexuality. And if homosexuality were as great a sin as it's preached in most churches, don't tell me that God wouldn't have had eleven commandments. Mm -hmm. God knows what He's doing. He knows exactly what He's doing. There, nobody said God had to have ten, ten commandments. That's as far as you can go, God, is ten. He could have had ten thousand if He wanted to, but He gave ten. If homosexuality were as great a sin and as great an issue as some people try to make out it is, then God could simply have added one to the ten. Am I telling the truth? But He didn't. Because everything he listed in the Ten Commandments relative to man's conduct toward man had to do with inflicting injury, pain upon someone else. Look at them. Adultery. Coveting. False witness. Lying. You hear what I'm telling you? No. By doing these things, we can cause injury. We can cause harm. We can cost our neighbors something emotionally, psychologically, monetarily, physically by doing these things. Isn't it interesting that gay and lesbian people can be who they are, they can live a good, godly, moral, decent life within the context of who they are, and they ain't hurting nobody. There is no victim. Nowhere in Scripture is it suggested that there is a victim in response to same-sex attraction and relationships. The Bible doesn't tell us that, that one is a victim and the other one is, you know, a predator. And, no, the Scripture doesn't say that. I owe you. When we come upon our neighbor, when we come upon our fellow believer, we ought to look at them and the first thought in our mind ought to be, I owe you. What do I owe you? Well, according to Paul, I don't owe you anything except to love you. Matthew 7 and 12, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, meaning an expert in the law of Moses, asked him a question, asked Jesus a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law. All the law. Not most of it. Not a good portion of it. Not the majority of it. 
all the law and the prophets. John 15, 12, and 13. This is my commandment, Jesus said, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The term friends that is found here in the Greek is translated from a word that means a friend, an associate, someone who associates familiarly with another, a companion. Yeah, but a gay man can die for his partner and it's sick. It's unnatural. It's evil. It's ungodly. No, it's not. No, it's not. Greater love hath no man than this. You cannot demean it. You cannot make it into something ugly. You can't make it into something dirty. Because, honey, Jesus, Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this. Jesus said that not. See, he don't care about what you have to say, but you sure enough better care about what he has to say. Sure enough. I told you the story. I'm closing. I told you the story before about a man in New York City that I saw on television one day. There had been an explosion at a brownstone in Brooklyn, and uh, they were talking about what had happened, and apparently. Uh, this man smelled gas coming from his neighbor's home and he went to his neighbors and told them he said man there's a powerful smell of gas over here y'all need to call in somebody you know well while he was there the house blew up and this neighbor who had gone to warn them was killed in the blast and the news woman said the man who had been killed in the blast was in his 70s she said, his longtime roommate. They've shared a home together for over 50 years. His longtime roommate. Didn't even say companion, just said roommate. Can you imagine? They've lived together over 50 years. You'd have to be pretty dense not to have some clue what's going on here. And she went to interview this old, this other older man, and he was in tears. And oh my God, it was hard. It was it was uh, it was so hard to watch. This man was so broken; he was just devastated. And he sat there, tears streaming down his face. He said, "What am I going to do? What am I going to do? How am I going to live without him? What am I going to do?" Yeah, that's his roommate. Yeah, that's wicked. That's evil. That's unholy. That's ungodly. That's disgusting. That those two men could care about one another. And that they could share a life together. And they could build a life together. And care about one another. For over 50 years. Well, that's disgusting. I can tell people, Tommy and I have been together just nigh on 20 years now. And, you know, people in the certain religious community just look at you like, yeah, whatever. Oh, but be a straight couple and say that, and they're applauding, and oh, they, they just think it's grand. Got news for you, honey. It don't take any less work for he and I. It's no less effort for he and I. It's as applaudable for he and I as it is for anybody. You just don't see it because you don't want to see it because you're convinced of something that isn't so. The only obligation you have, the only thing you should feel that you owe anybody, according to the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans, is to love. What a world we'd have. What a world we would have. What a church we'd have. If God's people actually lived the Word of God and felt only the obligation to love one another. Am I telling you? Am I telling the truth? Yes. Amen. Yeah. I owe you. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Mm -hmm.